Greetings, and welcome to a presentation by the Adrian Dominican Sisters of our A Sister's Story. I'm Sister Peg O'Flynn, and today we're having a conversation with our sister Kathleen Waters, and some of you may know her as Sister Catherine Daniel. She'll let us know how she got her religious name. Now, Kathleen is presently in ministry and resides in Prospect Heights, Illinois. Okay. All right. So, Kathleen, again, a great thank you and a welcome. And uh, we want to hear all about you right from the very beginning. Everything oh. you want to just always to know about you. Okay. Okay. I have a different beginning. Um, I was born at, uh, born in 1937 on December the 18th to a young woman by the name of Florence. And this was at, um, well, Cook County Hospital, which is now Strozier Hospital. Um, Florence was not married and she put me in a foundling home, which um, was what she didn't know she didn't know what to put it in plain English she didn't know what to do with me <laughs> so she put me in a foundling home and there I stayed for one year and she would come to visit me every once in a while now I've been told this I, of course I have no memory of it you know uh, when I I got some background but anyway she would come to visit me and at the end of the year she just disappeared and so I became a ward of the court. And in becoming a ward of the court, I was placed in foster homes. I don't know how many foster homes I was in before I was placed with Daniel and Catherine Waters. Okay. Okay, so they uh, already had a foster child. My, foster, my, uh, my mom, who became my mom, could not have children. Okay. But they were already a foster child. I had a foster child by the name of Helen. And they had had her since she was born, practically. Her mother had so many children, she put the, kid, the her child into a foster care. Mom and dad got her. And Helen was a precious child. And, of course, at that time, I was like three. Okay. About three, three and a half. I'm not sure exactly how old I was. But anyway, so mom had the two little girls and um, they lived in Roseland, which is on the south side of Chicago. They lived in Holy Rosary Irish Parish. And they um, they found mother found that it was too difficult to be going up to the third floor apartment with all our stuff, you know, two little bicycles, you know, how little kids are, yeah. you know. So anyway, they rented from a woman on the south side of Chicago, 88th place. And they took the first floor over of a bungalow. You all know what bungalows are, if you know anything about Chicago. And um, we lived there for quite a few years. Well, when Helen was going on six years old, her mother called one day and said to my mother, have Helen's things packed up I'm picking her up on Saturday. Now you have to remember this was the late thirties, early forties. I guess they could do things like that oh. in those days. So mother had to pack up all Helen's stuff and the mother came um, uh, on a Saturday. I can remember it. I This is one thing I remember when I was young and she took Helen by the hand Took mother took the suitcase out of mother's hand, went down the stairs to the front, you know, to the uh, sidewalk, and dragged Helen down the street. And oh, I can still oh, hear oh. Helen screaming, "Mommy, mommy, oh, mommy!" My. And that that you know that was that was it. And then uh, the following Monday, because Dad had my Mondays and Tuesdays off. Uh, we took the car. We still had a car. It was before the war, so we still had the car. And we took her bicycle and her toys and all her stuff to Helen. And when we saw Helen, she was, she had kinky, kinky, curly hair. 
my straight hair and she had kinky kinky and she was oh she was so cute but anyway uh she uh they i can remember mother and dad emptying the trunk of the car and giving the stuff to the mother and and I, the next thing i remember is me kneeling on the back of the car mm -hmm. you know the back mm -hmm. seat looking out and seeing helen and waving goodbye to her never Never heard another word about Helen ever, ever, ever. She was never mentioned in our home ever again. My, I'm, I know it was because my mother was just brokenhearted. Oh, of course. Oh my yes, word! Sir. How tragic. And, and I think she was always afraid that the same thing would happen to me. Uh huh. Well, you know, because uh -huh. our my mother just disappeared. No. Nobody knew where she was. And back in the 30s, people disappeared very easily. So, you know, but she was stuck with me. <laughs> so she she uh, she was a wonderful mother. My father, they were both born in Ireland. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Mother was born in County Mayo, God help us, as they always say. And mm -hmm. dad was born in, in Sligo, Sligo town, in fact. He came from a very wealthy family. Irish, you know, considering because they had a dairy farm in okay. Sligo. And it was his mother that uh, inherited the daily, the farm. They, she had nine boys and one girl. Oh, my. Yes. And my mother came from 12 children and they were as poor as church mice. They lived in one of those thatched roof houses, right. you know, that you see it was so picturesque. My mother used to say, they aren't that picturesque. <laughs> all the kids, <laughs> yes. All the kids slept on the loft upstairs. Twelve, six boys on one side, six girls on the other side, and that was their, you know. And then the, they had the one room down on the first floor, and their mom and dad slept down there and ate, and everything was down there. But anyway, uh, mother came to the dad came to this country because he didn't like farming. He was bound determined he wasn't going to be a farmer. And so um, his mother said to him, you go to the United States, you get nothing of my inheritance. And uh, my mother came at 15 with a nickel in her pocket. Her, un her uncle had sent her the nickel so, so she could call him at the hotel he was staying because he was sponsoring her. Landed at Ellis Island mm -hmm. and uh, she called him and he came and got her at Ellis Island. They stayed in the hotel. It was the 4th of July. And mother was born in 1903. So it'd be about 1918 this happened. So anyway, she, uh, the fireworks began, you know, on 4th mm -hmm. of July night. And she hid under the bed because she thought the English were invading the United States. Oh my. Yeah. So she, she uh, then he put her on the train to Chicago. And she became a maid in one of those places on Lakeshore Drive. He, in fact, she worked for um, one of the doctors. I can't remember his name, but anyway, he, there was a hospital named after him years ago. And so uh, she worked for quite a few years and she met my dad at a dance on the north side. My father worked for the Illinois Central Railroad for 47 years. Mom did a lot of different things. I can remember she cleaned houses and she she worked at all kinds of different jobs just to, you know, make keep money. us. Yeah. yeah, make money. I mean, I know I was the only child, but you still have to, you know, right. we didn't come from wealth at all, by no means. Um, I went to, as we called it, St. Joachim's oh, on, the, <laughs> on the south side. And I went uh, there for eight years, St. Joachim's now. <laughs> and we had the Mercy Sisters. And then I went to Mercy High School. Right. Where else would I go? Mercy Sisters. And I had the Mercy Sisters. Well, are we lucky? <laughs> <laughs> so we had. I had the Mercies for twelve years, and mm -hmm. I remember when when I told the story once. One of the sisters says, "Well, where did you meet the Dominicans, or how come you became an Adrian?" I said, "I had the Mercies for twelve years. Period." <laughs> no, Noreen Burns. Noni, Noni, everybody, okay. Noni, everybody calls her Noni. I call Noni. her Noreen because mm -hmm. I she we were together in high school, became friends. Noreen introduced me to the Adrian Dominicans. Oh, 
Okay. And that's how I, I became an Adrian Dominican. Interesting. Yes. She invited you. We, she should be on the formation team. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Go ask her. She said, she said, Marie, I think. <laughs> In fact, she, many times she says that she's my sponsor. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Uh, Sister Mary Richard Ray was my sponsor. Okay. Uh, from St. Philip near I, because that was the closest Adrian Dominican uh, convent to where I lived at the time. Well, back to, uh, it sounds like you had already made your decision. How how did your folks, your mom and dad, feel about this? My dad was thrilled Okay, that I was going to be a religious sister. My mother was furious. My mother was the type of person and she was a wonderful woman. I loved her to pieces. Yes, you did. But she was very demanding. And when she adopted me, she had all my whole life planned out. And I worked in, from the time I was a sophomore in high school. Right. I worked because she decided I should be working at 15. I was too old not to be working. <laughs> so I worked at Neisner's Dime Store in Roseland. And then I worked at um, the Little Flower Society, stuffing envelopes, you know, for all the literature that they said. Right. So the two, I worked there for two years. The first year I worked, I was at the dime store, which I loved. I loved being at the dime store. And I loved being at uh, Little Flower Society. I got my, all my girlfriends a job there. <laughs> so a bunch of us for Mercy worked at the Little Flower Society. Interesting. But, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun there, but uh, mother never accepted the fact never, that I entered the convent. Never, no. ever? Mm -mm, never. Did she come and visit you on visiting weekends? Oh, oh yes, yeah, she would come. Okay. She would come. You know, they didn't have a car by then. Dad didn't buy a car until after I entered, so they used to come on the train. Train. To, and to Adrian and to my different missions, but um, until I came to Chicago. But uh, they, um, my as I said, my dad was thrilled. He said, he kept saying to her, that's where she belongs, Catherine. That's where she belongs. Kate, he always called her Kate. Oh, Kate. Um, you know, and he was, my dad was top notch. He was the most, he was like a big teddy bear. You know, mm -hmm. he, he was so kind and so loving. And he had the most marvelous sense of humor. And I loved him to pieces, I tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He died in 1982 of throat cancer. Mother lived until 1998. Wow. So I, dad was dying. It was Thanksgiving before he died. And uh, I remember going into the room. Mother was downbound and determined he was going to die at home. And I remember going into his room and he, he wasn't really conscious. He was kind of in and out, you know. And I whispered in his ear, I said, Dad, I know you want to go to heaven, but you're so afraid to go because you're afraid Mom and I will kill each other in the meantime. And I said, I promise you, Dad, I will work as hard as I can to be what Mom wants me to be. But it, it never worked. But that was okay. Yeah. And he died um, the 3rd of December. So okay. it was from Thanksgiving to the 3rd of December on 1982. Wow. But, wow. Uh, and I, you know, to this day, I miss him terribly. Oh, but, I'm sure. But, but anyway, you, so. You kept to what, to the calling, you know, you, you knew that was what you needed to do to join the convent. And even though it was totally against your mom, you knew you had to follow that. Uh, I did. That, I did, Peg. You know, I just knew that. Hard. This this was my calling, and and I remember when we went, uh, I went to get the physical, you know, before you enter, you have to have this physical, and the doctor said to me, "Oh, he says, what's this, what's this all about?" And my mother says, "She's going to be a nurse," <laughs> and I just looked at her, you know, and I thought, "Well, I'm not going to correct her, let her, you know, that's okay, I don't care," <laughs> you know. So when we left the doctor's office, I said. Why did you tell him that I was going to be a nurse? And she said, well, I certainly wasn't going to tell him you were going to become a nun. Okay. <laughs> and that I mean, that's, to, how was that for you? That had very, to be very, very difficult. 
It was very difficult. Yes, it was. Because you loved your mom. Yeah. I loved her. Yes. You know, yes. I, I loved her. But, and I know she loved me. You know, there's no doubt about it. But she just, uh, you know, she just, I don't know what it was. I had th three cousins that were nuns. Mm -hmm. I had a, a one that was a mercy nun, one that was a victory no missionary, and one that was a Milwaukee Franciscan. Okay. Now they all left. <laughs> <laughs> two of them were in 30 wow. years Isn't 30 this? years when they left and the other one was in 15 years and I and I used to say to her mom have you noticed I'm the only one left <laughs> I Isn't had the vocation you know but um it's, so it, then you, you know, entered and you entered in 1955 I right, did. right after high school and then yes. you had your formation for a couple years now, I noticed you certainly didn't live up to what some people have said, you know, join the convent and see the world. Your place no. of ministry were Michigan and Illinois. That's it. But I was in 13 different schools. Right, right. <laughs> we can't go through all of those uh, ministries, but can you think of a couple and a couple people that were very instrumental in these ministries that made them unique or special for you? My very first mission was St. John's in Ypsilanti. Okay. John the Baptist in Ypsilanti. Yay, Trace Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Chase Golden was my superior and uh, principal, and I loved her dearly. Yes. I mean, I was as dumb as a doornail when I got out. I, I mean, I, I made profession, and I went out that afternoon. Oh, you're one of the... Oh, okay. I was one of them. <laughs> you were one of them. Okay. Yes. I walked yes. into a classroom of 65 children, second and third grade combination, the brightest of the second graders and the poorest of the third graders. I knew nothing. <laughs> she helped me, uh, Trice helped me, and another one who really was fantastic was Sister Victoria. Morowski, I think her last name was. Yes, that's right. Sister Mary Victoria. She taught first grade. She was right underneath me. And a couple of times she came up and she would say to me, Sister, are you having any problems here? Oh. <laughs> no, everything's fine, Sister. I, 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 you know, I didn't know. But anyway, I that was for the six months. The sister who, Roberta Mary, I think was her name, who went on to Dominican High because she made final profession. So she went on to Dominican High and I walked in the 3rd of January teaching these wonderful little children who I just, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, no. I look back on those six months and I think those poor children. <laughs> but you know what? That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did How we did not know what we were doing, but we certainly, we had to have it on. And at that time, the parents and uh, you respected sister. And they supported mm -hmm. us. We were blessed at that time. And the classes were yes. gigantic. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I can remember one of the little boys came to me, Ricky. His name was Ricky DeMarco. And, the, you know, you think that's back in 1957 or 58. And he came up to me and he said, my mom saw you at church yesterday. And I said, well, honey, I go to church every day. And he said, there was Sunday, this was Monday, you know. And he said, she said that you don't look a day over 19. I was, I was two weeks over 19. <laughs> so it was so funny. I was, you know, she, he said that. And I said, oh, thank you. Tell your mother, thank you. I appreciate that that nice way of you know Amen. saying Amen. such a nice thing about me <laughs> and was there another significant ministerial experience well i um i moved to chicago in 67 i think it was 60 something like that 66. and i 66 thank yeah. you <laughs> And I was at St. Celestine's, which was very nice. We had a big house there and we had a lot of fun there. Then I went to Homewood and I met Sister Mary Margaret Saunders. No one of, oh, she was one of the most beautiful women I have ever met. I she she was she was one of these people that you if you came into her presence, you felt a calmness. Good. And that's just the way she was. And I was having a lot of problems. You know, I, I 
I had two nervous breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I will admit that. Uh, I was at one mission that was extremely difficult for me. And after I left that mission, I did have a nervous breakdown. And at that time, I was, I was, I went to St. Um, Mary's and Adrian because they all thought I was headed home. <laughs> well, guess what? You Sister sure Damien <laughs> yes. was my principal and superior. And that woman pulled me up by the bootstraps and Wonderful. made she made me what I am today. She what really did. Wonderful. She she was the most beautiful lady. And you know, I just she just she made me the teacher I became mm -hmm. because I never thought I was that good a teacher, but she made me a good teacher. And um I was four years there. I loved it, loved it. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to the place that I was before, mm -hmm. but not the same superior, not you know, not the same principal. But that superior decided she asked for me, the superior oh. that I went back to. And I was the only one in the house who could do anything. I had to regulate the heat. I was the I was the procurator. I was the bursar. I was the assistant principal. It was it was a very bad year for me. Very bad year, you know. So, so anyway, that that's it. You know, you get over those those things. You know, it's just I look back on them and think, how the heck did you make it? But I and did. how did you? That was a great challenge. How do you deal with challenges? I deal with challenges saying, I'm going to do it. I'm a very stubborn person. I'm very stubborn. My mother told me I'd never make it in the convent because I was so stubborn. But I am stubborn. She was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I am I'm a very stubborn person. And when it comes to some things, I mean, not everything, you know, but when it came to things like that, I knew I had a vocation. And nobody nobody was going to tell me that I didn't. Mm -hmm. And nobody was going to put me out of the community unless I decided to leave the community. That was the way I handled it. Okay. Our, Wasn't easy. Wasn't oh, easy. But... We are. You stuck to it. That's good. <laughs> yes, I did. I stuck to it. And I, I've never regretted it. Never, mm -hmm. ever have regretted it. But um, those people, you know, I have really, and sister, another one was Sister Claire James Boyle. Wonderful, wonderful lady. She, she was, I had her, she was my principal at Homewood, St. Mm -hmm. Joseph's in Homewood, and she mm -hmm. was fantastic. So it's uh, one of the places that I enjoyed the most, two places that I really enjoyed the most being was at St. Mary's and Adrian for those four years and St. Patrick's and Joliet. Okay. I was there for 10 years. Longest I had ever, ever been any place mm -hmm. was that. And um, I did different things there because I was not real well. Um, I asked to get out of teaching for a while, <clears throat> excuse me. And I worked with the senior citizens Oh, good. For a couple of years. Wonderful. But, you know, I got too depressed working with them. I love the people, but they were dying on me. And that, that was just too hard on me. I couldn't I couldn't take that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I asked to, to go back. I, I was living with Sister Georgina at the time. And I said to Georgina, you know, George, I think I'm, I have to get back into teaching. And she said to me, it's about time. <laughs> So you see that to a good school one. Good. Uh -huh. So anyway, I said, but I'd like to stay here. And she said, Well, why wouldn't you stay here at St. Pat's? You know, she was living with us. Uh -huh. And so I went over to the principal and I said to him, Larry, I'd like to come back to teaching. And he said, Great, I have a room, I have a grade for you for next year. You're all set. <laughs> so I That's you know, good. it just it just happened. It, I just fell into it. It was wonderful. It really was. I love St. Pat's and Joliet. I just, uh, I was there 10 years and then I felt that that was long enough, you know, it's time to move well, How on. did you get to Prospect Heights? I don't know exactly where that is. I know Chicago. It's, not... Yeah, it's northwest oh, of huh? Chicago, okay. northwest of Chicago. Um, anyway, I, uh, Sally, I live with Sally at, uh, 
infant of Prague and Flossmore for okay. seven years. And Sally was coming up to Regina. She's got a job at Regina. And I said, you know what? I'm going with you. So she, she said, okay. My mother wasn't too happy about it because they were on the south. She was on the south side. But I just had to get away. You know, I just knew it would be better for me to be farther away. So I put out resumes, you know, you put out those wonderful resumes. And I got a call from the principal at St. Tarsisus, which is right on the borderline between Niles and Chicago. Okay. And all the policemen and firemen and live that area because they have to live in the Chicago in Chicago. Got it. And um, I went in for the interview with uh, Lori and uh, Lori said to me, you're hired. Just like that. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. She says, there's something about you. I know that you are a good teacher. She says, I, I don't need references. I don't need anything. Oh, wow. You're hired. You come next year, she said, oh, you're going to have sixth grade. And I said, oh, I hate sixth grade. <laughs> she said, well, it's the only grade that's going to be open next year. And I said, oh, that's fine. I'll take it. I'll do it. You know, that's that's the way I was. I would take if somebody gave me a grade and I didn't care for it, I didn't make any difference. You go. I, would te I would teach in that grade. So that's how I got up north. Taught at St. Tarsus for two years. Mm -hmm. Had a problem there because not I didn't have the problem. Uh, the pastor decided he wasn't going to renew Lori's, she was a laywoman. Um, contract, yeah. Contract, yeah, excuse me. And so anyway, I went to him and I said, why not? And he says, I'm the I'm the pastor, I can do anything I want. And I said, you know, you stand up, I told him this, I said, you stand up on the altar and you teach justice and you preach justice to us. Where's the justice? This woman is a lay woman. She's giving of her time and energy and everything to a Catholic school. And you just walk, up, walk along and say, you're not going to be principal next year anymore. I'm not giving you a new contract. He says, I'm the pastor. I can do anything I want. So but I said, well, spoke, but you spoke your truth. Mm -hmm. I did. I said, well, then I'm leaving. I'm not staying. I will not teach in an unjust situation. And I did. I left. And I sent out like 19 resumes and got no response. So that too <laughs> was, was a sign. <laughs> that too was. Yeah, but I did. I was one day I was, I taught up on the third floor and there were 52 steps to get upstairs. And Lori was a very large woman. And I could hear her huffing and puffing coming up the stairs. And I thought, oh, all I could think was my mother had died or something. You know, I, I thought something was wrong. And she said, Sister Mary Rita at St. John Bray Buff School needs a teacher for next year. And she said she just called and said I, she knew that there were some of our my teachers leaving. And she wanted to know if there were any ones. And, and she said, I have a nun for you. If you want, if you want a sister, mm -hmm. I have one for her. And so Lori says, go down and call her right now. I did. Had a, an appointment for the next day. Lori said, I'll take your class until you get here. Fine. And two days later, I signed a contract at St. John Brabuff. And there I was for 16 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right. We, we're we going to have to kind of bring this to uh, a close. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, once see, you think, oh, what am I going to say? And all of a sudden we have to stop. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> life, life goes on. Yes, it does. You have some, you've given us a lot of words of wisdom, but is there something in particular, you, a scripture saying, or just something that you want to leave us with a little uh, wisdom? More well, so I've, to given us, yeah. I think that I think the thing that with me has always been never give up. Good. Okay. Never give up. Mm -hmm. You know, I I just, you know, I just I just feel that I've had a lot of sickness in my time. I've had a lot of different things go on, but I have never given up. <clears throat> I've always felt that there's more. There's more, mm -hmm. and that's how I feel. Good. Good. And people, students have been blessed uh, by your ministry and by your presence in their life, which is real important. I, I, I have been blessed. I have been blessed with those children. I loved teaching. I would never do anything else. I didn't think of it when I was a postulant. And asked oh, no, no. 
but I would not give up teaching. I got to the point where I was, you know, you get to the certain point where, you know, it's, you're burned out and I right, was, right. and it's not fair to the children, but if I could still be teaching today, I would, I loved the children, I loved them. It's, it's very evident. So Kathleen, I would just like to switch, um, switch uh, stories or interests because you have written to the congregation about a friend of yours and her daughter, little Molly, mighty, mighty Molly. So if you could just quickly, briefly share with us, we have about five minutes uh, okay. about this woman, young child in your life. And uh, we would be grateful. I received an email from a, a woman by the name of Judy Byrne, who I am very good friends with. I, I met when I went to St. John's. I had four, she had four children. I had three of her children. We okay. became very good friends. And she emailed me and she said to me, Kathleen, please pray for Aaron Sheehan's Morris's daughter. And I said, so I emailed back and I said, what's going on? She said, they discovered she has cancer. I said, how old is she? And she says, seven. At the time she was seven, uh, just just turned seven. Now, you know, I guess maybe she was six, but anyway, she was around that age. And I said, well, I certainly will. And I said, how about if I send out to the sisters? I said, we have an email and we send it out to the sisters. And I said, do you have any problem? I said, check with Aaron. And she checked with Aaron and Aaron said, yes, please, please, Good. please, Good. please do that. So that's how I got started. Aaron is not related to me. She's a student. She's my former student wow. that I had many years ago in fifth grade. She's in her late thirties now, at least. And um, I have never met Molly. Mm -hmm. Never met her personally. We had hoped to get together this past summer, but it just never worked out. So I never met Molly. I only know Aaron. I don't know John, her husband, and I don't know little Annie at all. But I know them through prayer, you know. And uh, every time Judy, Judy, Judy Byrne kept me abreast of everything that was going on. She'd send me the email and I would forward it to on okay. our, yeah. the uh, congregation. So so yes. now little Miley, oh, you called her Mighty Molly. Yeah. Uh, she uh, just died recently. She died a week ago Wednesday. Okay, okay. What day is today? Thursday, a week ago, Thursday. last week she died Wednesday. Yeah. And um, they really thought she was going to be okay. Uh, they, they completely, last year, they took out all her stem cells out of her body. And of course, had her and, you know, made sure she was in the tent and everything. And they really thought that by doing this, this would eradicate this cancer. She had Wilms tumor and Wilms tumor is either you get well or you don't. There's no in between. And they thought this was going to work well. So she, they sent her home last June. And I know I sent the picture of her ringing the bell and she had rung the bell cancer free, cancer free. Everybody was thrilled that Molly was cancer free and she was fine all summer. And then in January, she was supposed to go in for a checkup and her mother noticed she had a big sore on her hip. And when they brought her in and they did the test, she was filled with cancer. They tried to do surgery to see if they could take some of it out. And they closed her right up and said, no, it was just a matter of time now before she'd left us. Okay, so, um, and you kept us all informed on that. And we were a part of that. And you oh, were yes. a part of that. So that, that in itself is another ministry that you have been very gifted with and to know how to help that young mother and the family. So we are grateful for that. And I'm sure the suffering of that Molly had was uh, lessened somewhat by the support that she had from you and the medical professionals, how blessed they are. So just know that we'll be with you as you attend to her funeral tomorrow. And yes. I certainly want to thank you, Kathleen, for uh, your willingness to share your story and your gifts to so many people in your 
teaching ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. And yeah, your beginning was challenged. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, yes. But I can I can endure challenges, as you noticed. Well, I know that. I certainly know who to go to if I need some prayer so I'm really going through something. So <laughs> I certainly want to um, thank you in the name of the congregation for all thank that you. you have been about. Thank and you. um uh, you're not ready for Adrian right now, that's for sure. No, for, no, 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 no. But, you know, it was very obvious, your sense of integrity. And thank you for your vulnerability and sharing who you, you are, who you were, and what you've been going through. And may you be blessed in as you continue you. in your ministry of prayer and presence at this time. I am very proud to be an Adrian Dominican. Yes, it's, it's obvious. And I'm sure the mercies are so disappointed. Oh, well, too bad. <laughs>